Over the weekend in Atlantic City, my favorite band of all time, Motley Crue, played their first ever shows without the very missed Mick Mars, with former Rob Zombie and Marilyn Manson guitar player John Five in his spot. I was lucky enough to be in attendance for the very first night of this, John Five's first ever show with the crew, along with Def Leppard at the Hard Rock. So today, we're going to discuss John's first performance with the band, uh, as well as the show as a whole, and I will give you my thoughts on the performance as well as a longtime diehard crew fan. Obviously, the stadium tour last summer with Motley, Leopard, Poison, uh, Joan Jett, and Classless Act was absolutely massive, grossing over $173 million, selling 1.3 million tickets, and averaging just over 37,000 tickets per night. So they have, of course, unsurprisingly decided to keep it going, now dubbed the World Tour with just Motley and Def Leppard heading overseas and to South America. As we all are aware, shortly after the stadium tour's conclusion, Mick Mars officially retired from touring with the excellent John Five taking over, and the band announced three intimate shows before heading overseas. Uh, the first, of course, taking place in AC at the Mark Giatess Arena inside the Hard Rock, which is around a 7,500 capacity venue so a textbook definition of an intimate show for these bands. Def Leppard kicked off the night promptly at 8.30, and as per usual, the band was great live. After all these years, they still certainly got it, and I also really appreciate the fact that on the screen during their performance, they showed quite a few pictures of former guitarist Steve Clark, who sadly passed away back in 1991, uh, being replaced, of course, by Vivian Campbell, very cool of them to still pay tribute to Steve after over three decades. My only complaint with Def Leppard, and this applies to Motley as well, uh, the show was essentially the exact same thing that we all saw on the stadium tour last summer. I'm not so much talking about the set list here as when you have a catalog of hits like these bands do. Obviously, you have to play a majority of them, and the sets just don't really change that much from tour to tour. I'm more so talking about production. I totally get that this is technically the world tour, so everyone outside of North America, they haven't had a chance to see it yet. But I think for such an intimate show, both of the bands could have done something special uh, and a little bit different, as it's a very, very rare occasion to see bands of this caliber in such a small room. Uh, and honestly, it wasn't that much bigger than my high school's gymnasium, maybe twice the size or so at most. To be fair, though, Def Leppard typically keeps their production somewhat low-key, especially when compared to Motley. Other than that, though, not too much else to say about Def Leppard. The set list was the same both nights uh, as according to Setlist FM, and I would imagine uh, a lot of the people were going both nights, so it would have been cool for them to swap out a few songs at least, uh, try something different, maybe something from the first record on through the night, because it never gets enough attention. Uh, save for Let's Get Rocked and When Love and Hate Collide, which they played this weekend, uh, the set list was identical to the stadium tour. Either way, though, they turned in a great performance just shy of 90 minutes. Moving on to the reason I drove eight hours to be there for Motley Crue. As soon as Def Leppard finished their set, and keep in mind, very minimal production, uh, just some screens that both bands shared and then some stairs, Motley immediately makes a statement as their crew begins hauling their massive set pieces onto the stage, which, mind you, is nowhere near as big as what either of these bands are used to. Somehow, though, they managed to fit basically their entire stadium production onto the stage, uh, except for the ginormous blow-up robot girls and the tall pineapple-looking things, whatever the hell those are. It was an hour changeover between Leopard and Motley, uh, but I will say I was somewhat surprised to see John Five hanging out so close to the crowd. Again, very small place, so not quite as easy to hide, but come on. You would never see the rest of the guys in the crew, or Def Leppard for that matter, unless they're on stage performing. But there he was, right in plain sight. I think he was doing some VIP meet and greets for a bit. 
And then probably like 15 minutes or so before Motley set, he hung out just off of stage left until it was time for them to go on, which finally happened at 11 o'clock. Much like Def Leppard, Motley used the exact same intro as they did on the stadium tour, uh, which is still pretty badass, I must admit, before they launched into Wildside. The set list was fine, same as the stadium tour to a T, except in their karaoke from hell bit, uh, where they play a medley of covers, which I could certainly do without. They changed the order of the covers a little bit, and they swapped out white punks on dope for Blitzkrieg Bop, of all things. Whatever. I would have liked to see some other stuff thrown in there, and I could do without the entire covers medley, as well as the dirt. I get that they found an entire new generation of fans from that movie, uh, and it's the one song in the set that John 5 had a hand in writing, but for me personally, I really wish they would throw in something old school like Red Hot, Louder Than Hell, All In The Name Of, Starry Eyes, On With The Show, a million songs that would be way cooler in my opinion. Uh, the Dirt is all right, but I guess it only feels necessary if MGK is going to be there to perform it live. Uh, I think it's a little awkward just hearing his bit on the song uh, to a track. I am very glad that Primal Scream is still in the set, though. I guess you could maybe consider it to be a, a bit of a hit to a degree, but still very underrated in my opinion. Fantastic song, and I'm a sucker for anything with a slide in it. Uh, that being said, I do have a handful of complaints about the overall performance as well. To start, the tempo of some of the songs felt way, way, way low. Uh, and some of them just felt like a bit of a slog to get through, honestly. Uh, to be fair, there could have been some sort of technical issues at night with the monitors or something. Uh, Nikki kept coming over stage left a number of times, having the crew turn things up for him. And of course, this was their first show since the fall, so likely a few kinks to still iron out, especially with adding a new member into the fold. In my opinion, John 5 fits into Motley perfectly. I don't think they could have found a better replacement, but there were a few uh, new things in some of the songs that I'm not really a big fan of. In Too Fast for Love, for example, I always loved the ending of the song, where they do the chorus, and then Mick would do a lick, then they'd go back to the chorus, Tommy does a drum fill, etc. Uh, I always thought it was a really, really cool part, but now, or at least uh, this past weekend, in place of one of the classic licks or fills, it's just palm-muted strumming. Like, Here's a very quick example of what I mean, though, if my fantastic noise-making wasn't good enough for you. To that end, though, the ending of Too Fast for Love, uh, immediately after the bit I was just talking about, they do this uh, thing where they sort of slow the riff down and kind of wrap up the song that way, which I thought was pretty cool. Same with Wild Side. John did some soloing that I thought complemented the song very nicely. Uh, I also want to note, though, that with John 5 being in Motley Crue, comes a lot more chugging, uh, likely due to John's time playing with Zombie and Manson, I'm personally, I guess, just indifferent to it. I don't love it. I don't have a problem with it. Uh, of course, every player has their own style. I don't think we need a 1-1 clone of Mick, but still worth noting. Another thing I want to point out is that every time I got a good look at John's face or they did a close-up of him on these screens, my opinion, he appeared to be a bit nervous. Uh, to be fair, while I do like John 5 quite a bit, I am by no means a facial expression expert of his, uh, but that's what I gathered from it. I, I most certainly could be wrong, but I would also think that no matter how great of a player you are, the first gig with any band that you're in is always going to be a bit nerve-wracking. I did like that he did a short solo to show that he is a more than capable musician if you were somehow unfamiliar with him, but it would have been cool to see him throw some more of his bluegrass stuff into the solo. Wishful thinking, I know, not really the right vibe, but hey, guy can dream. At one point in the solo, though, and I thought this seeing live, and someone commented this on the video that I posted of it as well, uh, for a brief moment, it felt like he was going to blast into Jordan by Buckethead, which would have been so fucking rad. Uh, unfortunately, though, he did not. Here's what I'm referring to. He did play a little bit of God Bless the Children of the Beast from Shout of the Devil, 
and a bit of Without You from Dr. Feelgood, though, uh, and that was pretty cool to see. Overall, though, John 5 did a fantastic job uh, with the crew, and I'm sure it'll only get better as time goes on. My other issues with the show have nothing to do with John whatsoever, but the rest of the guys in the band. The one that upsets me the most is the keyboard on Home Sweet Home. Home Sweet Home is my all-time number one favorite song in the world, but holy fuck, the keyboard sounded like complete shit. For one, that band has more than enough money to afford a piano, even if they have to rent one for the night. I've seen them do it on multiple occasions, and the song deserves to be played on a piano. If they absolutely must do it on a keyboard, though, holy shit, do it on something better than a Fisher-Price one. Even a first act would sound better. My kids have a toy keyboard that sounded better than that. Very, very disappointing to me. I'm sure I'm probably being a bit dramatic, but my God, it sounded rough. My fiance looked at me when they started and she goes, are they about to play the alphabet song? That's truthfully what it sounded like. My only other complaint is Vince. No, I'm not talking about how he sounded. Those jokes been going on for years now, and it's nothing new. Vince sounds the way that he sounds. Not great, yes, but obviously hundreds of thousands of people still want to hear him sing those songs. 37,000 people a night. My issue is his timing. I understand not sounding the same after four decades, and let's be real, Motley's focus has really never been about the music. But my God, it was rough. It's baffling to me how you can sing these songs for four decades, night after night, and still botch the timing. Uh, but it is what it is, because I will still see them every chance that I get. This past weekend was my 10th time, and I'm hoping for 10 more, because there's nothing quite like a cruise show. I was a little bummed that they made no mention of Mick whatsoever, but I'm also not really surprised. It did make me kind of sad, though, when they played Smoking in the Boys' Room. They swapped out Mick's name with uh, John Five, and when they did the cover of Blitzkrieg Bop, they put a Ramon-style logo up on the screen, uh, which, of course, included John in place of Mick. I understand Mick didn't die or anything, so I don't expect him to pay some full-blown tribute to him, uh, but it would have been cool to hear some sort of mention. If you were just a casual fan at that show... Didn't really know the members, didn't really know the history of the band. You really wouldn't have had any idea that there was a new member playing with them live. One final thing I want to mention, Motley has a reputation for being very shitty to work with, but by all accounts, including people I know who are much closer to the situation than I, they are treating John 5 like absolute gold. They're allowing him to do his own VIP meet and greets, sell his own t-shirt, uh, use their logo on, on advertising for guitar clinics and things like that. The whole nine. Hell, even his mic stand with Motley bears his logo, which is pretty cool to see. Uh, I get that John has been friends with Nikki and Tommy for quite a while, but still very, very cool to see. All right, though, I got to run. My fiance is waiting to give me some behind the nuts love, so I got to go. But thanks so much for watching. Feel free to subscribe if you want to see more. And I will see you next time.